So I have with me here today Paul Eisenberg from Bringing Hope Home. Paul, how are you? I am wonderful. Great. I'm so happy to have you here today. I appreciate you having me. This is fun. I'm looking forward to it. Good. Me too. This is fun. Um, (laughs) uh, So Bringing Hope Home is a nonprofit organization that provides unexpected amazingness to local families with cancer through financial and emotional support. You co-founded this organization after a very personal experience with cancer. Can you tell us more about your late wife, Nicole's journey with cancer and how it helped to inspire the creation of Bringing Hope Home? Yes. So I met Nicole at Westchester University in 1983. I was a freshman walking to class in October. She got off the bus and was talking to a friend of mine from my dorm. And I wanted to meet Nicole and the, my friend didn't want to introduce me to Nicole. (laughs) She really liked Nicole and was worried about me. And I kind of kept tabs on Nicole. She always had a boyfriend and she was really sweet and kind and lovely and got her to go out with me. Uh, I got a job actually at an old restaurant called TJ Rafters, which if anybody's from the Westchester area would remember it. And I got a job there just to get a date with her. And I worked there for about a month, got her to go out with me. And then we just dated and I got her to marry me in 1991. Love that. And fun fact, we are recording right now on pretty much Westchester's campus. Go Rams. Go yeah. Rams. Go Rams. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, we had our first child, Christopher, in 95, and then Gab- she got pregnant with Gabby shortly thereafter at the end of 96, and she wasn't feeling right. She wasn't gaining weight. She was very tiny, very petite, but she was like all baby the second time, and uh, it turned out she had stage 4 Hodgkin's disease. So she gave birth to Gabby, induced a little bit early, and then went right into treatment for six and a half years. And during that, during her journey, um, she focused on getting better so the kids would remember her and the kids could, you know, stay connected to her. And uh, she fought for six and a half years and was treated for two plus years at Penn, four plus or four plus years at Penn, two plus years at NIH down in Bethesda, chemo, radiation two bone marrow transplants, a ton of stuff, and sadly passed away August of 03. It's been just now 20 years. Wow. And during that time, she fought. Like, she I, – I've known tough people in my life. She, by far, is one of the toughest. And she just – she really showed a lot of people, including me, how you how much you can get out of life if you really want it. And she was so sick for so long but yet got as much out of life as she could. And that was very inspiring to me. And she passed away at home on a Saturday morning. And it was a lot. It was a lot. A lot for my family, a lot for my kids. I'm so you sorry. Know. That's, yeah. I mean, especially being a mother myself, it's, um, I, I, I can relate to why and how she was able to fight that hard yeah. or why she would want to, but I don't. I don't think the how is what I can relate to because that sounds. Well, like I hope it was you never grueling. Can. Hope you never have to worry about yeah. that. In all in all seriousness. Yeah. But she was just really remarkable, really remark. She was remarkable before she got sick. And I, I have to sometimes remind myself how wonderful she was before she got sick. She was a rock star after she got sick, but she was such a great person. She was very kind and loving and warm, very just really good. And all of those qualities are really what I would say shine through now in the work that you do. Oh, you thank know? you. That's very nice of you to say. I, th- I think that that's, you know, we've worked together on yeah. some projects, some video projects with Bringing Hope Home. And I would say it's not even just in what comes through with you, which it definitely does, but also with every single member of your team. We have a great team. And I, it's, what's beautiful about that is that Nicole's at the heart of that. Yeah, I think so. You know, we, we hire on values. Yeah. So it's really, I really, as much as I love people, I hate interviewing for jobs, people for jobs. Um, it's like a first date that's, yeah. you never know what you're getting. But we hire on our five values, which is integrity, family, accountability, creativity, and fun. And you have to be those values. Like it's not, it's not something you can hide. And we have such a great team. We've had such great people throughout our 15 year history. And everybody brings a unique set of skills at a unique time for us. And it's just it's just wonderful. It's just, I love going to work. It's amazing. I miss my people when I'm not working. I love that. I really do. That's yeah. really special. And 
Did bringing hope home start when Nicole was sick or after uh, she was sick? So that's a really good question. So the way our history works is the other co-founder is a wonderful guy named Tim Sherry, who's a dear friend. And Timmy and I were talking. He had actually sent with a couple other guys a Four Seasons weekend stay to Nicole because he they had heard that she was struggling. Oh. So we went and we got reconnected. And Timmy was hustling foursomes for golf outings for Coaches versus Cancer. And I said, Nicole had this idea. I would tell her I would, would see, you know, Jimmy and Mary, and they're great guys, but I never saw anybody because our kids were little. And she was sick, and I was working. So she said, well, I don't really care. Go start an event and raise money for a charity. So we started doing the Great Guy Dinner in 2001. And we did it through 2008 for the benefit of Coaches versus Cancer at the American Cancer Society, we raised like half a million dollars. Wow. And then between year seven and eight of doing that dinner, which we still do, um, we do it the first Thursday in May, we had uh, one of our great guys passed away. And we was, he was a school teacher, and we heard his wife and kids were struggling. So we, we weren't even an organization, and we went to one of our donors and said, every year you write a check for five grand to the great guy dinner. This year write a $3,000 check to the great guy dinner to the ACS. Give us the two cash and we'll give it to that family. And then we started. And that Timmy and I looked at each other and we still are baffled that we've grown this thing because we're not that bright. And we just said, There's there's a there's a need here. There's because we went through the need when Nicole was sick. I had a great job and there were still bills I couldn't pay. And, you know, when people go through cancer, even with health care benefits, they're out of pocket is can be tens of thousands of dollars. So there's a lot of gaps, and people need help to get over the hump. And that's really what we aim to do through paying these bills. So that's how we got started. It's amazing. And again, just so incredible that that all stems from such a personal lived experience. And also just the Great Guys Dinner was just you trying to get together with your buddies and, and you went do last something year, good. You go I was there. I remember that, yes. yeah. And it was a, it's an incredible event. I would highly it's recommend awesome. Yeah attending if you're local in the area that it's just uh, such a feel-good event and uh you know i think that there's lots of people that want to do good especially for families that are experiencing cancer but they don't you know maybe giving a donation to like a larger organization they don't feel like they they feel connected to it so much whereas i think what's amazing about what you're doing is that you really are allowing people to see we're raising funds to give directly to these families with a great need they have, yeah. which is trying to pay their bills and just survive beyond trying to battle this disease, you know, just trying to stay afloat. And so since the organization's inception, you have helped 9,003. These numbers might be different since I've looked at them last, but uh, you've helped 9,307 families here in the Philadelphia area right. gifting over eleven million six thousand nine hundred and twenty four thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's crazy. Nine thousand. I'm sorry. Eleven million six thousand nine hundred twenty four dollars. Mm -hmm. So truly. Cents. Yeah, yeah. Put a couple <laughs> cents in there. <laughs> <laughs> so truly, an amazing impact you've had thus far. Can you tell us more about what unexpected amazingness is and how your team goes about carrying out that type of support? Yes, I can. Unexpected amazingness came from our first employee, a really wonderful young lady named Lauren, who's since left to become a full-time mom, and she's, she was wonderful. But we did a survey for our top, I think we had helped 100 families at this point. And by the way, this year in 2023, we're a year, we're a calendar year company, we're going to help 1,007 families, I think the number I heard this morning. Unbelievable. Um, for the year, and then we're, we're going to, we're at about um, coming up on, uh, we want to probably hit 10,000 families by the end of the year next year, which is really exciting. Very um, exciting. So we did a survey for these families that we helped in the beginning, and we asked part of the survey question was, what three words would you use to describe bringing hope home? And two of the leading words were unexpected and amazing. So we made up our own term. It's actually trademark, unexpected amazingness. And and it's the kind of word that if you saw it on a paper and didn't have the context, you'd be like, huh. Oh. But when you hear our team, the family department, talk to our families, or you meet our families that I know you've met through some of your work, or you meet our donors who we have donors that range from a dollar 
to hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're all connected and get unexpected amazingness because the practical concrete thing of what we do is social workers nominate families to us, any type of person, any type of cancer. And if they're in active treatment to live in our area, we pay rent, mortgage, utility, car payment, or food. And you get a call from our team who are so kind and loving. This, my whole team is just really genuine and really compassionate. And they'll call and say, hey, we understand you're going through a hard time. You were nominated. Here's who we are. We're going to help pay some bills. What do, you need? what do you got? What do you need? And usually there's a pause on the conversations I've heard. And then there's a, wait a minute, what are you going to do? Who are you? Why are you calling me? <laughs> like, like, like what's the catch? What's yeah. the catch? And then there's tears. Because you're getting people, and I was there. You know, you get people when they're really raw. When they're, when they're going through it, somebody in their house is dying or is sick. And that's, that affects everybody. It affects everybody. And what I tell our team is we, we have the ability to make their day better. We can, and if you look at it, we pay between one to $2,000 in bills, depending on how our fundraising is going. And that's not nothing, but it's not a million bucks. Yeah. But it can be life-changing because now – not only is somebody paying your bills, but somebody you don't know is checking in on you, cares about you, is making a concrete step to make your life better. That's a big deal. It is. And I will say that in – so as you had mentioned, I did some interviews with yes. some of your uh, families. And I would say that was the thing that struck me the most was exactly what you're describing. They were saying that – the, the biggest impact for them beyond just, you know, what a relief it was that the bills were paid was your team that makes that initial connection mm -hmm. and then continues to check in on them. I know one of the women said, like, I just couldn't believe they kept checking in on me. Yeah, we, and they just care so much. And we, we do whatever the family allows us to do. Right. Some families, they know they need the help, they get the help, and then that's enough. Yeah. It's more transactional. A lot of families are like, I, I want to pay it forward. Okay, well, you get better first. Yeah. You know, or we want people to come to our events, so we invite them at no charge to be our guest. And we just want to keep them involved. Yeah. So. And you're doing a great job of that. I Like I said, I think it just was so clear and obvious in speaking with the families that. Oh, good. You know, how much they not only appreciated the help, but that you're really making a, a deeper impact in that compassionate way. And that actually brings me to my next question because I want to talk about Hope Nation. Yes, that's also <laughs> trademarked. Yeah, and I love it. So <laughs> how has that this community really rallied around your mission, this Hope Nation? Can you define what Hope Nation is? Um, and how is Hope Nation helping families with cancer feel more hopeful um, and to have less stress? So I think the best way I can embody it or describe it is – one of our donors, Ted, embodies this guy who went through his own, was going through his own cancer journey, takes some time off from work about four or five years ago, probably like eight years ago now, and he said, I want to volunteer. I said, oh, okay, great. So we got to clean up the storage facility. We got to take the trash out. We got to do this stuff. That's, nobody ever talks about that when they talk about working in charitable work. It's, he's like, really? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then we used to take our – our nominations in by fax in the old days. And we take our nominations in from the social workers on the first business day of the month. So we have a very defined process around that. Now, fax was great unless the first business day was on a Friday and the fax machine ran out of paper <laughs> and paper wasn't put in again till Monday. So you get all this information, you have to keep it all straight. So he looked at it, and he turned out he worked for this big financial company. And he said, you got to make this uh, – uh, you have to infuse technology in this because this is ridiculous. And I said, oh, okay. Between all the other things we're doing, <laughs> you know, with three people, we'll, we'll figure it out. So he put our entire database on Salesforce and helped us run it. And he connected us as an organization – into so many other levels of business so we could take the time and be close to families. And if you look at our donor base, 
Our donor base is a group, a company, an individual, a foundation, a school, a family, a team, a neighborhood. Whatever that group wants to do, we'll, we want to figure out a way to help them do that. That's what Hope Nation is. And then we have volunteers that give us time. They work an event. They come in and answer phones. Or they digitize our database. Or they come in and they say, okay, we're going to help you with this silent auction. Or come be on a podcast. Or here's a business opportunity. Or here's a process. Have you outsourced this? Because, you know, I'm, I'm a sales guy by trade. So we have all these great, smart talented, engaged donors and board members that just are so good about picking up the phone. To be a board member with us, one of the key things I tell them, and they all laugh, but they know I'm being serious, is they got to pick the phone up when I call. Because <laughs> I'm going to call you with a question because I don't know a lot. Yeah. And I'm going to call you because you're a smart person, and I'll say, hey, we have this situation, we have this problem, we have this challenge. This is what I'm thinking, but I don't know. That's really what a board is meant to be yeah. for a nonprofit. I mean, it's it's meant to ha be comprised of people who can add value to your mission, you know, and who are invested in it and want to. Yeah. Um, so I think it's very good that you hold them to that. But they're great because they always they always get back to me. They're smarter than me, which is fine. <laughs> My goal is to be the dumbest person at the company, and I'm pretty. If I'm not there, I'm pretty close. <laughs> but Hope Nation is people that just. Our job is to make it easy for people to give and be good and do good and feel good and make a connection with people that need it. Yeah, That's our job. We're the conduit for that. That's how I look at what we do. And Hope Nation are the people at every level that support that, from our team at the office to people that just give their time, treasure, or talent, to our board, to the social workers at the hospital, to our families. It's really a team effort. Yeah, and, and if you think about the family, those poor families are – getting a call from somebody they don't know and they're letting us in like the people you interviewed for that segment they're all unique they're all fantastic they're all kind they're all struggling at their own level and they opened up their world to us yeah we paid some bills but they let us be part of them in a very raw time at a very challenging vulnerable time and that's not lost on us yeah that's really a big deal yeah and, you, and like I said, <clears throat> you can see that, I think, on every level of what you do. Did I answer your question? Does that, that matter? Yes, you absolutely okay. answered my question. And actually, I, it, when I think of Hope Nation, um, it just makes me think of how I constantly see your sweatshirts all over my town. So I, love it. I, I live love in Havertown. It. I love it. And Havertown, I can tell you that I... Haverford Middle School is one of my favorite places. Yeah, I can tell you that not a day goes by that I don't see a middle schooler walking around with a Bringing Hope Home hooded sweatshirt on yep. and this is funny because it's actually before we worked together okay i was seeing these sweatshirts all over town i'm like what is this what's bringing hope home um and so i know that the, i now know that the haverford mm -hmm. middle school hosts a fundraiser they for you and fundraiser. part of the incentive for the kids to get involved is that they get one of these yep. sweatshirts so can you tell us more about the students bringing hope home program and how could schools get involved if they're listening yeah so that started as a side kind of set up because donors would call me and say, hey, my kid is in grade school, middle school, high school, college. They need to find community service hours. They need to do this. Can, do you guys do anything? And, you know, we'd say, yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> figure it out. That's become kind of my mantra. We'll figure it out, you yeah. know. So we started having – we still have a school in Philly who we helped one of their teachers like, 12 years ago, still sends us a check wow. every year, every year. And we started, we started getting more schools. Next thing you know, I'm going to basketball games and volleyball games and Olympic games and field <laughs> days, and which I love. My dad was a school teacher, so I kind of I think I inherited part of that gene. And we said, well, what if we made this a business? What if we made this real part of our P&L, made this part of our business? So we, we formalized it. We started managing the process. Now we have – the answer to your question is um, whatever school we've had, elementary, preschool, elementary, middle school, high school, college, um, that have done everything from a 5K to the Hope Olympics at Haverford Middle School to a volleyball tournament at Ruston High School 
to um, lots of different things to the tune where that part of our business raises almost three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars dollars 400000 And with, the way that we approach it is we're there to shepherd and make it easier. We have one person, Bran, who runs that program. But we don't tell the school what to do. We want the school to do what they think they want to do. And then we make it easy on them. Love that. And it gives the kids, like, the, the business reason was we do we get a kid connected to us in, in preschool or kindergarten or elementary school, and then every time they go to the next school, they bring us along. Yeah. And then they go to college, and they graduate college, they get a job, and they remember us. So it's kind of, there was a method to our madness, but it's it's whatever that school wants it to be. And all they have to do to get involved is go on our website and shoot us an email and bringinghopehome.org, shoot us an email and they can get involved with us. It's amazing. And it's also so incredible what you're giving the kids who are getting involved. You're planting a seed in them of service and community and giving to yep. people who need it and just giving them that like tangible experience of this, the the funds you're raising are going to help people in your own community. Yeah. You know, that there's so much power and in that. And kids today are so smart. Yes. And yeah. so talented and so advanced, technologically speaking, versus the Atari generation. <laughs> and they, you can, you can, it's really cool to watch kids say, hey, we want to do this. And you, you help them out and come up with a couple of solutions for them. And then they run with it. Like, yeah. we have lacrosse clubs in, in college and baseball clubs in college that do their own fundraising, and they run it all. And the fact that they're raising hundreds of thousands of dollars, I mean, these are not small right. projects that are bringing in the, it's real a money. few dollars. And That's, it's helping families. Yes. It's it's helping, an, and we can deploy that money in about a week. Wow. wow. So That's huge. Yeah. I, thank you for explaining that, because I, like I said, it <laughs> that was such a huge... Uh, it made an impact on me seeing these sweatshirts everywhere. And I think there, there's a certain level of pride to the kids of wanting to wear these sweatshirts. Yeah. I mean, the fact that I see them everywhere. It's a great school community. The principal, Haran, and all oh, the yeah. teachers there are phenomenal. Yeah. And we have so many great school partners. We're very, very blessed. Yeah. Well, I th again, I think it all leads back to your intent and the community that you've already built thus far and all the people you have working on your team that you're attracting you know, those kind of folks to you as well. So you also have many other great programs and opportunities for people to get involved, mm -hmm. donate, or even volunteer. So can you tell us more about those type of programs, events, or opportunities that listeners could help support? Yeah, so we do about five to six big events a year. Uh, they're all on our website under events. We do a big 5K down the shore in New Jersey. So if people are in the Philadelphia area and they go to Sea Isle, we do a big 5K at the last Saturday in June. That would get about 1,000 people. We do the great guy in, uh, dinner in Baltimore. We do a great guy dinner in Philly. We do a big golf outing the Tuesday after Labor Day in Philly. And what's really exciting is if you have listeners in Chicago or Miami or California, they can do a fundraiser themselves, and we can take the money and help families through their fundraiser. So we have a lot of external events, and it's really whatever you want to do similar to the school program. If you're a hockey head and you want to do a hockey tournament, do a hockey tournament. You want to do a watch party at your house and have everybody kick in gift cards for grocery stores? Do that. You can send it to us, and we'll make sure the families get it. Yeah, tell me about the gift cards at the grocery stores. I see you do a lot with Acme, right? We do a lot with Acme. Acme Markets, part of Albertsons, is a big supermarket supporter. So is Safeway. We get gift cards from them. Uh, and what we do is every family that we pay the bills, they get gift cards for grocery store. We never give any family money. That was a big deal with us. We didn't want to... We didn't want cash or checks to exchange hands with the family. It could be misappropriated because things happen. So what we do is we get the bills with the nomination, and we write the checks directly to the bills, right? But then we will send gift cards for grocery stores or big department stores that sell groceries so the family can go out and get what they need. That's really great. important. That's great. And it's such a great way to involve a bigger company like that that's yeah. willing to give. Like Thanksgiving, Acme gave us $100,000 in gift cards. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, but it went out because people need it. It's funny. I feel like I keep saying amazing and unexpected amazing. It's unexpectedly amazing. amazing. <laughs> unexpected oh amazingness my. is your thing, but now I'm understanding why. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it we is actually, all amazing. I walk around like a big dope in the office going, it's unexpectedly amazing, isn't it? <laughs> my team just rolls their eyes. It's like my team are all my teenage kids. They all just roll their eyes at me all day. <laughs> I don't care. 
But you keep doing what you're doing because it's uh, working. I'm the big dope. It's fine. <laughs> it's all good. I love it. So on this show, we also talk a lot about compassion and community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I say there are two points that very clearly are pillars of your mission, oh. bringing hope home. Can you tell us what your own definition of compassion is? I think, I've always thought about this. I think one of the reasons it's so personally impacted me, and I had somebody say this to me one time, and I, I, I kind of didn't get it when they said it. This guy who was a friend of mine came in after one of our great ideas before we were our own organization, and he said to me, this is something bigger than what you think it is. I was like, I don't know. It's a dinner. It's fun. It's good time. You know, nice people. And he's like, no, I think you can do a lot with this. And he goes, and you need to do it because you couldn't make your wife better. And to me, compassion is taking what you've been through and working to make it easier for other people who might go through the same thing. That's what I think it is to me. Because he was right. I couldn't make any Nicole better. But I I hear, like, you met Jeff and his wife, and we can help them, and we can make it easier for them, and we can give them a little bit of a break and make it a little bit more pleasant is the wrong word, but palatable. And that's what we should do. And if you've been through something rough, how it would have affected you or somebody in your family. How can you turn that to doing something good and making it impactful for somebody else so they, they have an easier road? That's what I think it should, that's what it is to me. I can't tell you how much I relate to that in my bones because I lost my mom and mm. that's why I started the nonprofit that I now mm. run too. And I, I always come back to that, that it's being able to take the pain that we've been through and use it as a catalyst for for change, but also just for the ability to show up and support people who are going through something similar because you know what it's like. There's so much power in that. And uh, I think it's so evident that th- how much power there is in that, just looking at what you've been able to accomplish thus far. Well, it's not me, right? No, not just you, but I mean just I, I, I work on with the this whole. team that shows up every day. And all we want to do is help more families. Yeah. Families are one A. Families are number one. Money's number one A. Yeah. Because we can't do anything without money. Right. So when our development team's working to raise money or putting on events or whatever it is, or our marketing's promoting stuff, or our family departments are making calls, we all want to help more families. Because the need is ridiculous. And the need is never ending and never ending will always be there. But also, I would say, you know, I, I talk to people a lot about this on the podcast, too, that there is this element of once you get a taste of how good it feels to do good for other mm-hmm. people, uh, you just want more and more of that in your life. And that, that's a good thing. I mean, I think that's also what I hope we can instill in this younger generation, too, is, you know, have that experience of, of participating in a fundraiser like we're talking about at the mm-hmm. middle school or any of the schools and and see what it feels like. Because once you have that feeling of doing good for mm-hmm. someone else and showing up in a compassionate way, it's just exhilarating. It's addicting. It's, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It's fun. It feels good. We have a lot of fun. Yeah. We really do. <laughs> you do. Well, we really do. You're a lot of fun. So I think that, Thank that, you. has, a lot of fun. that has a lot to do with it. Your family's so lucky to have you. Just fun <laughs> everywhere. Um, I do like to have fun. That's for sure. So uh, this is going to be my second to last question okay. here. We talk a lot about compassion and community, I said. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us the importance of community in your opinion, especially regarding those who are battling cancer? Yeah, and I think I would relate that to we help families. We don't help patients. We help families. They're not patients to us. They're our family. We treat them as best we can, even with a little craziness, like family. And that could be a family of one. could be a family of ten. So I think community are all those people that we've talked about today at every level because it's people that just want to be okay or to make people okay. 
I would tell you, I get so many phone calls from people that I know saying, hey, my brother's neighbor's cousin just got diagnosed. Do you know where they can go? Do you know how they can get there? Do you know this? Do you know that? And because we're in this world, we're able to make those calls. Like I'm going to see a doctor today who's a friend of mine who's an oncologist. And one of the biggest services he does for us is gets us into second opinions faster. Mm. Because a lot of times what will happen is somebody will get diagnosed with cancer, but they can't get seen for two weeks or, or longer, and they're freaking out. So yeah. we'll call this doctor and say, hey, can you get this person in, knowing that they're going to have to wait all day, but they're gonna be, they'll be seen like in two days. So that community to me is a group of people that combine to make it easier to do things. You would be shocked. Like some of our most valuable donors don't give us money. They'll fix a car for us, for one of our families. They'll fix a roof. They'll come in and fix the plumbing. They'll give somebody a car. They'll give somebody a job. They'll give somebody um, a kid get help get into school. They'll, they'll do those kind of things that the family is just as important as paying the electric bill. But it keeps them moving, it keeps things going well for that family. And that's, to me, what community does. That's such a great example, those things that you just mentioned, because I say this a lot on the podcast as well, that to do good doesn't mean that you have to take on this, you know, starting your own nonprofit or right. some huge grand donation or gesture that you're making. Actually, what I hope to inspire in people is take those skills that you have, whether you're an auto mechanic mm -hmm. or you're, you know, you're really good with sales or you're really good with... Um, social media or you're really, you know, and find a cause or an organization that you feel passionate about what they're doing and offer up your time, mm -hmm. offer up your skill set because it's invaluable to it these is. organizations and their missions. That's such a great point. And I'm so glad you brought it up. Yeah. And then, I mean, if you think about it, we, we went into the nonprofit business. We didn't, we didn't set out to go into, we had set out to put together a dinner, have a good time, enjoy each other's company, raise the money. And then we saw a gap. And it wasn't a gap because other organizations are bad. There was just this gap. And we started looking at it and paying attention to it. And then we were like, we can fill, we can help fill this gap. We can't fill the gap completely. And then you start, then you see the concept, right? And then you start figuring out all the other little things. It's like your business. Here's your business. You do this. But then you got to do payroll. And then you got to do bookkeeping and then you got to do HR and then you got to do process and then you got to do technology. Next thing you know, it becomes a business and you got to figure out how to run that and be efficient so you can provide compassionate support and caring and unexpected amazingness to local families with cancer. So it's a whole thing. Yeah. And it you have to it, it takes this whole community of people to pick the phone up or to come out and sit with you and have lunch with you or a cup of coffee with you and say, "Hey, I don't know what I'm doing here." What do we do? How do we do this? Who do we talk to? How and you just got to go do the work. Yeah, and people want to help. That's that's people the thing. Help. People want to help, and they don't always know where to start or how to yeah, help. And true. that's why I'm always just saying it over and over again, like a broken record here on this podcast. But like, just find a place to use your your unique skills and talents, um, and something that maybe aligns with you and and uh, you know an organization that just you feel passionate about because also your passion will drive you to do more There's and really more stupid things. Your passion drives you to do stupid things just work all the time. <laughs> it can exhausting. <laughs> it can, but it also can drive a whole lot of good. There's too. a lot of good. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to be oh, here with I'm us really today. Thankful too. This Thank has been a wonderful it. conversation. This is like the best conversation ever. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> um, so before we wrap things up, yes. can you tell us, how listeners can find more information, follow along mm -hmm. with Bringing Hope Home. Where can we find you? So our website's bringinghopehome.org, bringinghopehome.org. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We're out there, BHH, BHH Philly, Bringing Hope Home. We're out there for everything. Great. And actually, I wrote a book about our experiences with nonprofit called Lessons Learned that didn't get on Amazon. No way. Way. Ah. So glad you it mentioned was basic, that. It was basically written, here's, the, here's why you need a board. Here's how we screwed it up. <laughs> here's how we fixed it. Here's what you should do. 
That, that is valuable. It's like 12 chapters of that kind of thing. Here's, here's why you need to do A. Here's how we screwed it up. Here's how we fixed it. Save yourself the time and do it this way. Oh. Doesn't it feel good, too, to be able to give people that information? I've found that, too. When I first started my nonprofit, there was a whole lot of hoops I had to jump through or just the, these challenges I had that, in hindsight, I could have avoided if I had known, but I didn't know. And so to be able to give people that information when they're on the, the like foundational level of starting yeah. a nonprofit, Well, that's so many people huge. were good to me to sit with me and say, okay, here's the way you need to get insurance. Mm. Here's the way you need to hire people. Here's the way you need to bank. Here's the way you need to file. I had no idea. Because it's all different for nonprofits well, now, than a regular business. We're in business. six states now, right? So we're in PA, Jersey, Delaware, New York, Connecticut, and Maryland. You have to file separately in every state. We have a great law firm, Troutman Pepper, in uh, Berwyn, PA, and they give us uh, pro bono, plus filing, all this stuff, because they believe in what we do, and they help us file in state. They help us what paperwork needs to go where, who to write the check to. That's awesome. And it's it's never stops. Yeah. You know. But that's again to your point about Hope Nation. Like that's. They're part of Hope Nation. Yeah, these are part of Hope Nation. These are people that show up and really believe in mm -hmm. what you're doing and want to help advance your mission. And that's so, I, I get so much excitement when somebody, like we just had um, former employee's mom pass away, right? She had been sick. She really battled. She's giving us in the obituary, please make donations to bringing Hope home. That is a huge deal. Yeah. Whether it's a hundred bucks or a million bucks, somebody connects you to that important person in their life that they're at this important time and they believe en enough in what you do and what you try to do to, to, to drive people to you. That's humbling. That speaks volumes. That's wonderful. Yeah. And we get a lot of that. That's another, it's kindness. another great example of like how you can, help support a mission, you know, in your own unique way. That's a, you know, obviously it's like a devastating situation to be in, to have to be choosing any charity to donate funds to for a loved one that's passed away. But yeah, to, to have a cause that you know is doing great work, you know, and, yeah. and you feel connected enough to do that. That's, that's huge. We're very grateful. I love it. Well, thank you again so much, Paul, Thanks for, for being me. here with us today. Um, and thank you for sharing. I'm going to link in the show notes everything that you mentioned here today. Say your book title for me one more time. Lessons Learned. Lessons Learned yep. by Channel Paul Eisenberg. I've only written one. <laughs> okay, so great. it won't be hard to find. We'll make sure that it's on there. Yep. Thank you again, thank Paul. You.